All righty, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to say y'all to <laughs> reinforce what's going on in the chat. Um, we're glad you're here. Welcome to our fifth web session of the spring 2021 XAPI learning cohort. Just as a reminder, this web session is recorded and we will be sharing the recording out to the folks who cannot make it. Uh, we love to see your engagement on social media, so feel free to use the hashtag XAPI cohort, tag the XAPI gnome, or you could tag our presenter today, Aaron Silvers. All of those uh, handles and hashtags are up at the top right-hand corner of my presentation if you need to take notes. Today, we have our guest speaker, Aaron Silvers, who's going to talk all about nitty gritty and is repping that gritty uh, with talking about statements, state profiles, oh my. Uh, and then we'll hop into team check in. So, this is the second week that we'll have some team check ins. If you are the presenter for your team, please share which team you'll be representing in the chat. And our producers will be having you ready to give you mic access and camera access when we get to that part of the presentation. As of today, we're at 571 registered for cohort, um, which is awesome. Uh, lots of people and also shows growth from our last session, which is my cue to remind you that it's never too late to join cohort. And we might have folks joining at any point throughout the semester. So if they're joining your teams, um, don't be surprised. See how they can help or maybe they're just there to observe or lurk. Today, behind the scenes, you have me, Jess Jackson. I'm the host of XAPI Cohort. And then we have our producers who help us with all things tech, Aaron and Jamie. We are officially at week five. So today we're getting more in the weeds with XAPI and more nitty gritty. We're going to talk about statements, state, and profiles. Next week, we'll get e even further and look at learning analytics and how to do that, and especially with video. Um, and then we'll hop into different um, standards at work with IEEE and what that means with Shelly Black, Shelly Blake clock. Um, and then we'll hop into creating dashboards and visualizations and have our case studies and project team demos. Um, I just want to remind you that project team demos, everyone is welcome to present. Your project does not need to be perfect or final. Um, it is a chance for you to share out with cohort, get feedback, and really jam with, uh, with, with our thought leaders here in cohort. So please consider presenting your work um, during those last week. All right, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Aaron. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being in theme. Um, and I'll let you hop right in. Cool. All right, let me get going on sharing things. Uh, This was just working a second ago. Here we go. We can see it. Okay, Great. Okay. Aaron. Awesome. All right. Howdy, everybody. Um, first of all, hi, my name is Aaron. Uh, a few things about me. Uh, I'm an Aquarius. Uh, I really like uh, barbecue and coffee and bourbon. Uh, and I've been doing stuff with XAPI really since like 2010 when we kind of started bringing that idea to uh, the federal government and then started working with ADL to produce XAPI as a spec. And then now it's actually just about to be released as an official IEEE standard, like all said and done, all the boxes checked and everything. Um, and now, of course, obviously, there's like 571 of you starting to learn about this and play with it yourselves. And that's just now as opposed to like, you know, over the last 10 years. So we have a lot of things going on. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons learned, some really hard lessons learned that hopefully you won't have to learn as hard because I did all that hard stuff. And hopefully you, we can take it from there. So let's get going. Boom. So today we're going to just talk about a few things. All right. Uh, in my presentation, it's not going to take forever, but I, you know, don't be afraid to shout if I start going down some rabbit hole or tangent because I tend to do that. Uh, we're going to talk about how XAPI profiles solve data engineering challenges, all right? A lot of the work that we spend time on right now just to try to get XAPI to work, there's ways now that we're gonna be able to shortcut a lot of that heavy lifting that we do, all right? With that though, comes some 
you know, specificity gives you interoperability, but also then requires us to really have a, a, a clear way that we define in a, in a shared sense, what kinds of problems we're, sol we're going after trying to solve and collectively agree about how we want to try and solve them. <laughs> uh, and uh, I posit that we can shape these problems by very, very straightforward, you know, observable barriers to knowing specific things about things, right? Those will give us a guidance as to what kinds of questions to ask and what kinds of things we should be looking for out of data. And when we start engineering data, what we should be putting into the data to be looking for things, right? And then we get, then I'll wrap it all with a highlight reel and a tour of new technologies and tools and things that'll be fun for you to play with, all right? Let's get ro rolling. First of all, XAPI profile solve data engineering challenges, all right? What do I mean by that? Well, learning analytics seems to be stuck in this place that's mostly built based on like the hard work it takes just to organize data to move it from one place to another and for things to go when you filter them into the box that you want them to go in, all right? Now, Lean Six Sigma stuff, like I have a background in Lean and Six Sigma because that's how OCD I am. Anyway, when we talk about, you know, the, the types of waste that is typically why you start going down the road of doing Lean or doing Six Sigma, or Lean especially for eliminating waste, they're around things like the, the, def the defects or the mistakes or the bugs that we find in any kind of implementation. And when we start dealing with data and analytics, we find that a lot, right? Or we produce way too much data for us to be able to analyze, or we're constantly waiting for data to go get, you know, uh, you know, make sure that the data got out of the learn e-learning, you know, interaction that we had into the LRS, then we have to wait for it to come out of the LRS to maybe get moved into some kind of API services chain that then moves that into like our reporting queues, right? So there's moving things around. Every time we have to make a hop, we are, every time we have to move data, shape data, move it around after it's already processed, we are spending tons of time on engineering stuff and not analyzing stuff. And that's really the thing that we're, I'm trying, we are all trying to break out of when we're starting to talk about, about doing XAPI profiles is to get out of doing the wasteful activities and get, give us more time and more energy to go after like more high value or gained activities. So how do profiles fit then in the process of generating and storing and retrieving and analyzing data? Well, right. We know that through profiles, we can define a few things uh, that several implementations, different vendors, different tools, different, so different pieces of software can access the same rules from one rule sheet, right? And in this, from, the, from an XAPI perspective, we can define activities, right? Uh, the activity types, uh, the attachment usage types, right? Um, the documents that we might want to involve or create or manage uh, at, as, from like a state level uh, or an activity level, um, the extensions, the ways in which we might want to define XAPI statements into greater detail, and the verbs, which are pretty obvious in terms of like, you know, this is the thing that we are, this is the ac action that we are capturing or observing in the moment. Okay. But really what we're dealing with, it, where the efficiencies we're going to find that we gain from XAPI profiles are mostly on the, what happens when we generate the data. Right now, we spend a ton of time trying to clean up data once it's already generated. What we're hoping is going to happen, what we're starting to see happen in the initial rollout of XAPI profiles is that we're streamlining the alignment of data at the source. So when that data is created, it's already being created in a way that we know we can, that's data that we can use and we know exactly how to use it. Okay. But there's other gains that we have from using XAPI profiles that go beyond just the, the creation of that data. Right. When we start talking about like, where data has to go or how to route it, right? We can start looking at the rules around how the, how we create statements or what a profile expects out of statements and start using it to help us filter what statements are acceptable to a particular LRS. And this is good for 
like larger enterprise type of environments where you might have LRSs that are more transactional or deal with more of like the chatty type of, you know, interactions. And then out of those uh, LRSs, there may be a data strategy for an enterprise where they're harvesting more career and capstone and milestone type of activities for, to keep track of certifications or, uh, licensing or compliance or what have you. There can be any number of reasons why they want to do that, those kinds of activities and do that kind of data harvesting. And the XAPI, the semantic rules of XAPI profiles can help us map those things uh, dynamically. All right. Now, there's also the gains that we get from retrieving and analyzing data that's already aligned and cleaned up and pretty much ready to use, right? So, uh, the learning for record providers like simulations, adaptive assessment tools, and those consumers like those are like our reporting tools, for example. All right. Um, we can then we we can use profiles to like inform the dynamic queries, or we can inform contextually specific diagrams, charts, and reports based on the kind of information that we are anticipating to show up in terms of patterns, etc. All right. So we're everything I hope you're seeing is like uh like a real drive towards automation. We are trying to get rid of having to manually, you know, hand jam by the dev, the dev term, all right? The, the, all the, the spec language and all the statements and stuff like that that we put in there. We want to be able to have tools that kind of insert the right things for us so that we don't have to do all this like copy pasting and then hoping we got everything right. All right. So, one of the things that has really helped kind of that's going to really help propel this more uh, mature approach to, you know, uh, working with XAPI really um, is the advent of a new piece of software that's about to be released by ADL. That's the advanced distributed learning uh, folks out of the department of U S department of defense. They are about to release what's called what they're calling the ADL XAPI profile server. All right. It is an like an authoring tool and a server for profiles. And what that allows profile authors to do is have one central or at least a feder, you know, eventually a federated space where you can author profiles, you can store them, that you can make them available for other systems to consume, and you can manage and maintain those profiles over time. And the idea of working with working groups and of particular value to working with profiles, uh, this profile server does a couple things that are really, 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 really hard to do if you're manually trying to build profiles yourself, or especially if you're trying to manage them, it's any kind of scale, right? So we can control statement structures, right? Uh, by helping to, because it's basically like a wizard like tool to help us like refine exactly the rules that we need to have. And it does a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes in terms of all the semantic web rules and things like that, that are associated with X API specs. And if all I'm saying is Greek to you, what you need to know is this, we're going to create rules with an external document. All right. That everybody uh, that wants to contribute to an X API project can adhere to and that that one document will that would then inform authoring tools and in, in development environments and backend systems uh, with the exact same sheet, the exact same rule set, all these different things that are are based on it. All right, so that all these different parts of the learning kind of you know, sausage making from the the authoring to the retrieval to the moving to the processing all of that stuff is going to be governed by one set of rules right that everybody abides by that helps us do control statement structures it helps us to communicate the anticipated patterns the things that we that as from an instructional perspective or at least a job performance perspective job task analysis perspective these are the things that people expect to be important or happen it helps us to filter those statements through determining property so before we even unpack all that data we can look for little aspects of that data of data to make sure that the statement qualifies for further analysis or unpacking or automation and then we can automate all the hard stuff about you know it if uh if a certain statement is supposed to be like another statement and trigger some system event later on down the line, we can start to automate that, that, that stuff. All right. And the rules and the instructions around that so that it's not always up to 
a per, whoever's opening up a manual to figure out what is supposed to happen. The machines should be doing some of the stuff for us. Okay. I'll stop right there for a second. Questions. And I'll stop sharing for a second and just take a look at the window because I can't see uh, both things happening at the same time. I can read the questions to you, Aaron. Or it won't. <laughs> How scalable just will that be? Really quick here, going through the uh, question for Aaron. What is the LD in JSON LD? Uh, that stands for linked data. All right. So JSON is JavaScript object notation. The LD part is the linked data part. That's right. All right. Uh, other questions here. Boom. Lots of, all right. People already answered that question. It's cool. How scalable will the ADL profile server be? I can imagine the server just getting signed with a few big enterprise customers. Well, um, I think a lot of that's going to still, a lot of that has to be, to be determined. You know, how, whether or not there will be, you know, one or multiple instances of an XAPI profile server that are publicly, you know, accessible versus what's accessible to the government versus what enterprises might want to do versus how LRS vendors may want to incorporate this technology further on down the line. There's a lot of open questions here, but this is meant to be scalable. It is meant to, you know, the first iteration of this of this profile server. Who I, you know, we're going to find out how scalable it is. Currently, it's going to be. It's looking like it's going to be hosted on USALearning.net, which is the uh, office of uh, personnel management uh, for the U.S. government. Um, so, with uh, with its plane at that level, it's built to scale. All right, because they're backing that for like all of U.S. federal government to be able to access XAPI profiles to be listed in one, basically like in a centralized registry. Um, whether or not it stays that way or it grows or it evolves over time, hard to say. I'm You'd have to ask somebody at ADL for what their plans are or what the strategy is on that one. Uh, suffice it to say, it should scale. The, we're, we're doing this so that we don't have to keep redoing this. So that's the idea. All right. Uh, back to screen sharing then, now that I've answered some questions and let's get on to the next section. So, boom, with great specificity comes great interoperability. So there's a supply chain of learning outcomes. Okay. Everybody who's part of this webinar or is part of this cohort, all right, is somehow likely involved in the supply chain, whether you are creating content or you're trying to analyze data or you're trying to make sense of that, or you're trying to use feedback from, you know, from, gathered from learning experiences to help coach somebody, or you're trying to use that feedback to learn yourself, all right? So currently, you know, well, I would say not even currently, a very archaic model for e-learning would look like you have uh, an instructional designer and you may have a project manager and maybe you have a tech person behind the, behind the scenes helping to administer the LMS and figure out, you know, score me weird stuff that doesn't work, right? Well, you got to look at a more modern approach to LMD where there's a lot of different pieces that are coming together to help, you know, improve employ you know work outcomes performance outcomes work outcomes clinical outcomes patient outcomes all right as we start moving to a more outcomes focused approach towards instruction and training and education as like these are the things that we're looking for are real signs of the real world of what's happening the amount of people and the variety of skill sets that are needed change they evolve right we're we're not in classrooms like we used to and even classrooms were kind of not quite right as an implementation. Well, now we're getting a little bit more picture of the complexity that's needed. We know that there are architects and psychometricians and learning scientists that get involved in like, you know, where, when the stakes are high enough, right? And we have an idea of what the kinds of information that they need, the kinds of things they need out of it, right? The, the kinds of things they need in the ways in which we can automation help advance their work. Project managers, product managers, learning experience designers, these folks have different roles, but they have some similar needs. They need clear requirements and the information necessary to satisfy them. They need reliable sets of data for analysis to improve a learning experience, and as well as to improve learning outcomes. It's not just about improving the outcomes. They're also trying to improve the learning experience to help improve the outcomes, right? So it's not just about getting 
better grades or getting better work out of people. It's also about encouraging them to want to learn more, to want to be more invested in their own learning, to have more of an agency and autonomy and a voice in, in what's going on, all right? System software engineers, DevOps, business analyst folks, all right? They also have needs for automation. They have, and their needs are not quite as, you know, high and mighty as those of learning experience designers and project managers, right? They want to be able to quickly administer and trigger uh, quality and performance testing. They want to be able to make sure that workflow behaviors are automated and there are redundancy and backup systems for in ways to check that those things are actually working when they're supposed to, because it's, Kind of easy to find out when things don't work. It's not always easy to figure out that things are actually working. So having ideas of what those are, that's where those that's where our, these folks are need to be concerned. They need that automation to tell them what's happening at a regular basis. All right. And then there's front end and content developers and quality engineers. And for them, you know, they need, you know, they need to have clear instructions and a very like drop down like this is the thing that we need to do this is the, these are the require hard requirements that we need to meet and this is it right so what do xapi profiles specify with json ld well i've talked a little bit about that before so there's the activity right it defines a specific interaction with an object or with, by an actor in a statement all right, there's an activity type, and this could be things like a course, a video, a book, however it is you want to start to organize the classes of media or instruction uh, that you want to deal with, all right? And then there's the attachment usage type, right? So this could be like the certificate that is issued upon the completion of an e-learning course. There may be, you may want to have control, very specific controls over different media objects uh, and their uses. Document. Now, this defines information about the data that's stored in state and agent profile and activity profile resource for X API. All right. So what this allows us to do is have a place like a scratch pad to write notes that we want to then access later for whatever purposes that we that we may need. Now, some of those things may be standardized over time, and some of them may be just particularly for that application context. All right. Right now, I'd say it's early days to understand the best uses for that, but we do know that there are uses for it, and I'm sure we're going to, over time, uh, make it, fake it, and break it. So uh, let's talk about extensions. They define a specific piece of information to be expressed in the context or the result of the activity uh, of, a of a relevant XAPI statement. All right, so our scores, a confidence score, for example, you know, anything that's not not a standard score that would be like a, an assessment score, but anything else like that, anything else we might want to keep a score on that isn't quite for assessment, we might want to do that through an extension. There may be any uh, number of reasons why you want to have an extension. We'll talk to some of those uh, coming up, all right? And then obviously the verb, which we I'm sure are all familiar with. So. The JSON LD is a bunch of JSON LD gobbledy gook. All right. It's readable. You could pick it up and read it and you can see kind of what it says. And if you read it enough, you could start to really understand what it actually is saying in there, even if you have a very just a passing, you know, familiarity with X API. All right. Because most of the stuff is written to be fairly just pick it up and read it. Right. But we know that a JSON LD, a technical looking document is not going to help anybody who doesn't have a great technical background to implement anything you know that is in, as it is maybe intended right whether it's by engineers or otherwise right so we need beyond just when we talk about building a profile it's not just that json ld document we need actually a very robust kind of you know instruction manual all right, uh, that has to answer a bunch of questions for us so that we can implement XAPI correctly. So it has to answer architectural questions, all right? Like, what is the scope and purpose of this profile? What conventions are, do you need to follow when you're building things to this or when you are creating things anew to contribute to this data set? Um, what automated or human actions are triggered by specific data elements and so that you are aware of their importance and their priority in the actual operations of the thing, not just the technical, like it checks the box on this one little automated test and that's fine. More of architecturally, it needs to do this thing so that these other work processes end up happening, 
right? That gets into those business requirements. What are the business cases that are driving this XAPI profile? What requirements need to be met for others to review and test and to deliver the developed media? So that gives us a little bit more contextual placement of like, oh, this is what's supposed to happen when things are good, right? What are those conditions for success, failure, or the other state information, all right? And then there's the data engineering stuff, right? Aside from just the architectural stuff, there's the, just the lifting and the moving of stuff, right? What acronyms of terminology am I going to be expected to know to read or follow the, a document? What patterns of XAPI sp statements are going to be important to anybody, all right? And how and where in the XAPI sp statement should competencies be expressed? Like some of the stuff sounds like it's pretty straightforward stuff, but until you actually start working with XAPI a couple of times, you don't realize just how many questions you have to actually answer in order to make stuff work, all right? It gets us to the point of well, how well-defined problems end up making really good profiles, all right? So why do people want to make profiles? Well, it comes down to basically two types of use cases. People either want to automate stuff or they want to manage stuff, more or less, all right? You want to automate the tooling of statements. You want to automate data engineering, data integrity, data optimization. You want to manage contracts and contractors for the same effort, for similar efforts. You want to manage changes, all right, all in one place. But why do people really want to make profiles, right? Sometimes it's to instruct contractors on what's required for conformant data. And sometimes it's going to be to define a small set of things that you're going to want to use in a regular domain, kind of like a, a open badges. Um, sometimes it's going to be normalizing uh, data from media types or modalities. Uh, sometimes you're just going to want to document like a, a professional accreditation or a certification program or competency set so that other people can tap into the same ways of identifying things. And for the most part, for right now, I think a lot of us are going to be making profiles just to learn how to make profiles and just how to get into working with XAPI. And all of those th use cases are totally okay. Okay, so let's refine that question because we're going to talk about how we refine questions a lot when we start working around analytics and XAPI. What projects are good candidates for an enterprise to begin using XAPI protocols? Not writing, creating, using, right? If you're creating a bespoke per curriculum that has based has already some you know, XAPI profiles or XAPI coding, you know, as ascribed to it already. If you're working on developing a certification, if you're doing a data migration, any kind of thing where you're going to have lots of data that's mapping to one specific set. Uh, if you're doing enterprise collections of data, if you are dealing with high stakes compliance, learning modalities, if you're managing multiple contractors and multiple contracts, uh, if you are dealing with second and party and third party integrations with multiple parties involved, these are good projects for, these are good uses for XAPI profiles. If you're an enterprise and you're even starting to look at this work right now, okay? Now, if you're looking to actually create your own profiles, let's take a little step back there. Not all these projects are probably great projects for you to start your first profile with, all right? A bespoke curriculum, a data migration, you know, even managing multiple contracts for a complex project, but it's your project, something that you control, you own, or a second party integration where you're working directly with like parties that you're going to be building to your requirements, all right? Those are good first projects to start writing and creating profiles because these are the elements where most of the things that are that you need to identify and document are within your control if you're the one creating the profile, all right? which is how we get, start thinking about problems as shaped by observable barriers to knowing specific things, okay? So the one thing that I've learned over the last year of working very exclusively with XAPI profiles on a very full-time basis is that um, there are multiple ways to translate impacts and outcomes into an XAPI profile. There's multiple ways to skin a cat, right? So let's talk about one way that we could do it, all right? So let's take a, a, a what seems to be a harmless question. How do learners use our e-learning content, all right? That's a really broad question. I'm going to take a break and stop sharing. I'm going to ask y'all in the chat, 
what are other what are deeper questions that might be other ways of asking that question in more actionable ways what are some other ways that you might ask you know or a more specific question that gets us more of maybe more actionable answer similar to how do learners use our e-learning content i'm gonna stop sharing or i'll just switch for a second and see where we're going how many learners complete the course where do learners click? Yeah, well, yeah, right? As soon as we start talking about use as a general term, there's all sorts of different ways we can define what use is, right? These types of questions are the great questions to be asking when you start putting together data strategy because it's when you start refining those questions into more interesting questions that you might want to actually know about is when you start thinking about, okay, well, what would I need to actually know to do to know any of that? So let's refine that question it down a little bit further too, which I just did when I was here. How do we know if they read something on screen? How are they using the resources we provide? How are they navigating the content? How are they skimming? Are they skimming or just skipping the content, all right? So one thing we want to do is, first of all, understand, you know, come up with some ways of defining, you know, as a, when you're on a team, a shared view of what the question is that you're going to try and answer with data. All right. When you are starting out on a net, developing a, a learning analytics strategy and you are starting out to figure out what an XAPI profile is, it's going to help you achieve that strategy. All right. It starts by asking the questions. All right. What does that question mean? Maybe it means, how do we know if they read something on screen? And then in order to answer that question, we might want, we have to ask like, how do we identify everything a person might read in a, in our course? Is there a difference between, or a distinction between instructions and directions? Maybe we use both. Maybe they have specific purposes. All right. The fact that we're do we may be making some arbitrary choices about how we label things and design things and organize our content. But once we start measuring stuff, now what's being made explicit, now that those decisions are, however arbitrary, are testable. Now these are things that we can actually see. Do they work? Are these the right choices? Are these the right ways? To, the, are there distinctions that we need to know? It could be the same difference. Also, it's like, when you think about all the things people read, there are assessment questions, but there may also be rejoinders, responses that the content gives you depending on how you answer a question, right? We might want to track those things and understand what their learner's interaction with those uh, what that is. We might want to understand, uh, we might want to know about, and we probably do want to know, uh, how a person may access or make use of citations or references or resources or multi-page resources like how are they paging through, you know, multiple pages of content that is itself an offshoot of an e-learning course? You know, do we want to actually know what they're reading in a simulation? Like if they open up, a, a, if they look, click to look at a computer monitor in a simulation, do we want to know what they read? Like how deep, how down, far down the rabbit hole do we want to go? Those are the types of things we need to start to understand. Then... There's a whole other way of looking at that question, which is how are they using the resources that we provide? So that question then gets us in, rather than about reading. Now, how do we just identify everything a person might click on or drag and drop or tap, touch, swipe and draw, or manually manipulate, all right? So all of that can be including navigation elements, interactive media, assessment items, whatever they might highlight, whatever they might copy and paste, anything that they click on, et cetera, all right? Already, you can see, and you know, this I think reflects a lot of what you all were saying in the chat, but you can see that there's infinite ways in which you can go down, right? You don't have to do them all. You just have to make decisions as a team of how you want to do these things or decisions as an industry, as a community practice of how you want to do these things, right? So then there's another way of looking at this, which is what does e-learning use e-learning content look like, right? So we're there's the one view, which is like, all the ways in which we are just sitting around a table, maybe thinking about like how what this problem might look, entail. But then there's actual use, looking at people and actually observing what's going on, right? What are the patterns of statements that are needed by, you know, you know, defining the interactions, right? What are the what are the groups of interactions that are lying within the dimensions of a of the problem, right? How are you framing 
you know, the 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 way in which you the ways in which you want to study what's happening in learning in in in, in learning. And then, you know, what are the patterns of statements that will tell you that when you start looking in that box? Okay. And then how that gets into like, describing that pattern of use of e-learning content. For example, and there are different ways in which you could skin that this cat as well. For example, all right. Uh, I work with a lot of medical content. So, um, you know, having, imagining that you're a nurse in, you know, in a simulated scenario, all right, is a common theme around the kind of e-learning that I'm involved, that I've been involved with, right? Well, when, if I want to demonstrate reviewing a patient's chart, all right, in an e-learning course or an e-learning simulation or scenario-based learning, there are two ways in which I might approach this in terms of just patterns of verbs. Or, and so remember, these are arbitrary choices that we make in terms of how we describe the activity that's happening on screen. But there are architectural, technical, and business implications by the decisions that we make. So it's so I'm bringing this up. These are very subtle types of nuance, the, you know, changes to our workflow and our habits about how we create in our process. But they have real meat to them in terms of their impacts. So for example, if I choose to want looking at a pattern of use that is like uh, an open and a close, like I want, I opened a resource, to, I clicked to open, I saw the resource, I clicked to close, and that tells me that they read it or they used a, a resource in, in, in the learning. Okay. Well, you know, there are this much, their approach having a two different statements, an open and a close that I'm looking for a pattern in between them. They may be very good for real-time or almost real-time analysis, particularly in indexing and querying. So if like if, if I'm looking, if I need to understand all the opens and all the closes, and I need to be able to pull those things together, all right, but as separate items, all right, for a number of reasons in terms of like querying that data, indexing Exiting that data, bringing it back in for reporting or even back into the actual e-learning course itself, right? There may be reasons why you want to have that as two separate verbs that are that you end up very rapidly finding just that verb and that in the timestamp that tells you everything that you need to know for your analysis, at least in that sense. But there's another way to do it, which is that you use like one verb like interacted and as an object of that verb, you talk about, you then start looking at what is it that, they, that the user interacted with, all right? Now, if you are doing, you know, processing of that, of these XAPI statements kind of in the background as like in batches, which is kind of how most folks do things when they're not real time, all right? You might be okay with doing some more deep, you know, in terms of just like keeping things simple in your data model, using one verb and then using a taxonomy around the different ways in which you identify the elements on your e-learning so that your analytics then might have a strategy that is based on comparing across, you know, different e-learning courses, the different approaches for similar uh, instructional learning, navigational items, things like that. And there's any number of reasons why you might want to do one or another or both or something completely different. All right. Again, these are conversations that we all need to be having with our teams, amongst ourselves, or amongst our industry. Okay. How do statements change the value of things? Is another factor that comes into play. All right. Extensions can be defined in XAPI profiles to store and change that the value of the information that's needed. Okay. Um, so these extensions can then be made to the activity or the context of the result of an XAPI statement. And so um, that can help us tell us, like, for example, what was opened or closed or what was clicked. So when we start looking at this interacted, that second, you know, approach, right, it's the extensions that can tell us then exactly what it is that we were clicking on. So, uh, because out of interest of time, I'm not going to go and open up a, web, a profile server and start digging in all the rabbit holes because I could do this all day. But there are pieces of this puzzle that are already put together for you, and I'll start to, and I'll go through a few of them right now. Okay. Um, so, for one thing, in terms of workflow, as the profile server gets stood up and as profiles start becoming populated in them by ADL, by publishers, etc. All right. 
the first step in our workflow when we're starting to try to figure out our data strategy should be one, one is already on the profile server that we can reuse. Like we, if there's, if the thing does the thing that we need it to do, we should not be redoing it. More profiles is not necessarily better. More concepts is not necessarily better. All right. Smart reuse, appropriate reuse is exactly what we should be doing. And I know that's hard to see or look like, and it's not as sexy as lots of new stuff, but lots of new stuff is not helping us get better data or learn any more about ourselves. Okay. How does it, so, so how does the X, how does this profile server accelerate the development of an X API profile? Well, it's going to do a few things. Okay. One, it's going to help you find the right things. We have a really good, it's got a pretty decent search in there. So if you're, if you're looking for an item and it, it's going to, and if it's in there in any, any way, whether it's a pattern, whether it's a concept, whether it's a profile itself, all right. It's going to pop up. It's going to show you're going to be able to, so looking for things will net some results and if there's no results it means it's not it really is not there which is possible right now because everything's going to be new it's going to be fairly it should be fairly obvious as to which profiles are actively used because we have graphs that are available to everybody to show you like how often something's been accessed um how often it's been exported uh what you know even like its api access so that we could actually start to get a sense of not just like who's using the profile so much as is it actually being used and are people actively contributing and using to this or has this been sitting here and dying on the vine? So we have a number of different ways to show you the activity around a, a given profile. All right. Um, we've spent a lot of time and a, and a lot of uh, effort on user experience research and de design uh, to help make sure that we can prompt people to do the right things. We really wanted to make a tool that was fairly simple to use. The, the, if you had a passing, uh, you know, understanding what you were supposed to do with profiles, you should be able to use the tool. And even if you were starting from scratch, starting cold, you could be guided into developing this stuff. So, you know, you know, this is meant to create reusable concepts. It is meant to surface those things that have already been developed and may be useful to you so that it, and automate things so that as you're entering stuff into a profile, if it catches an identifier that is already in the system, you're going to get prompted to be like, yo, is this the thing you want? Because you don't need to redo this. You can just use this one right here. It's really nice and pretty. and It's all ready for you. That's the kind of the, that's kind of the intent behind this stuff. We're trying to take the we're trying to take the hard, painful work out of this work. So very quick highlight reel. I know you can play Megan Torrance. I didn't come up with a name for this uh, presentation. Somebody else did. Anyway. Um, Picture the uh, the profile server. We can you got we got accounts. We got a working group so that you don't you know author a profile and then you know maybe you know unfortunately decided to run off to Fiji. Um, working groups are a way are the way in which uh, as a contributor who contrib who may be authoring a profile, the profile belongs to a working group that other people can belong to. Therefore, other people can contribute to it, manage it, etc. Right. So we're try we 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 have a it's not very brain work in terms of our, you know, user account system, but like there's a means for work to persist. That's the idea. All right. Uh, you can organize by profiles. You can look at concepts, statement templates, patterns. You, there's clearly a search. There's a, a small, sort of very lightweight admin, and there's APIs to get this information dynamically as JSON LD into whatever systems that you need. Okay. When will this be available for download and or online use? Well, I'm told it's going to be Q2 2021. So pretty soon you're going to be seeing stuff from ADL. And what is next for XAPI profiles? All right. Well, um, there are a number of IEEE standards working groups that are happening right now. I may be actually running them or at least one of them. So for example, uh, uh, Every month right now, we're meeting on the fourth Tuesday to talk about the JSON LD standard for so we have a spec for XAPI profiles. All of this work that you've seen so far is based on those that open source specification. Now we're going to turn that into an open source standard, not just specification, but standard through IEEE. Uh, that's a working group that's running now. It's going to be going for the over the next two years or so. But that's not all that's happening with XAPI profiles and standardization. Already, we understand that because of that JSON LD document, we need 
good technical guidance, implementation guidance. So we're going to be spinning up a whole other standards group separate from the JSON LD group just to talk about how to write the instruction manual. So if you are interested in being able to work with XAPI as easily as just reading the instruction manual, then you need to be starting to participate in that effort as it starts getting spun up. Because without your, without you saying exactly what it is that you need, you're going to be, you're going to be living with the best decisions that people like me have to make. And I'm crazy. You don't want to be listening to my ideas. You want your ideas. So you should start participating and have me Determine less things for you. You all should start speaking up and telling telling us what y'all want and need. All right, uh, and then from there we're going to start spinning out. We have carved out all sorts of spaces so that as profiles, you know, are adopted by the community and have like a, you know have a great amount of adoption. Things like CMI five I expect will be on that in that list. All right, we will standardize those profiles so that they become you know kind of like available as de facto standards, ready, you know, organized and ready for anybody who, who needs them. All right. Can't stress enough to get involved. We meet on the fourth Tuesday of every month. All right. 10 years ago, I was just a dude. Now I'm a dude to run stuff. You in 10 years or five years can be a person who runs stuff too. I don't want to be running stuff. I want to be making music. I want to be working on ProLogic. I mean, I do like running stuff, but I also want to do other things too. And I want to create opportunities for other people to participate and step up and lead. I'm clearly not going to live forever. So uh, please join, please participate. Uh, don't let this be just run by old people <laughs> like me. Uh, and thank you. That's all I have to say. And thank you all for joining. I'll answer your questions. And obviously, thank you, Gritty, for uh, the inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see two questions in the chat um, for you. You answered one, um, and one comes from Izzy. Uh, I'm trying to think. Turn off here. Yep, there's one question. Can you hear me okay, Aaron? See if there are any questions that I did not answer, mm -hmm. or were not answered. There's just two. One from Izzy, um, and it seems right, there's so Izzy's. Izzy has a question. Uh, it seems there's a difference between XAPI profiles you might build that are specific to your organization and uh, which you might keep private and XAPI profiles of the video profile that are shared and publicly available. Is this that the case? Entirely possible. Um, so I, I, I will tell you that, you know, I right now, I have developed an XAPI profile for the curriculum that you know, we're creating through Elsevier for, you know, nurses who are in their first first years of nursing in our, you know, learning professional skills as identified by the American Nursing Association. Okay. Um, the only people who have any benefit from the data model and can read that data and know what to do with it is us. So right now, there's not of any benefit to anybody else for us to be doing that. However, once you know, if I was working with the American Nursing Association and like they were like, yeah, I'm good with what you've done there. Let's let's put that out and make that public. The minute I make that public, the way I've identified um, those competency sets from the American Nursing Association, if that's an XAPI profile that other people find, then other people will be using those same identifiers, which means the reports that I've already created for just on my XAPI profile will now be able to read the, the data that other people produce and be able to report on that data as well because they will follow the same rules, right? So um, there are plenty of reasons why I may not want to share something publicly out uh, and publish it publicly. It doesn't mean I may not doesn't mean I may not want to have a profile for it. So yes, Izzy, a long way of me answering your question is yes, there are that is probably the case, which is not very formal. All right, I think I'm going to hop in. There's one more question, Aaron. Can you hear me okay? From Martin, but maybe you can answer that um, in the chat. For some reason, I can't hear anybody now. So yeah. I <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Um, and Aaron, there is 
a question in the chat. He can't hear me. Um, so we're going to hop into where your team should be and do a check in with the teams. Um, we are riding right near up the top of the hour. So as you come on board, and I think we have Miranda, Rachel is hopping for Team a -Raz, Brian, Kieran, um, and Brian. Um, if we can get them all teed up, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and Rachel shared for Team A Rise. Um, they met, um, and and I was in that meeting, and we talked about kind of the the framework um, and got started on what's needed and what what will be moving forward. Um, I think we now have uh, Team Scorm and XAPI gave an update. That was John. They're actually dis. Um, breaking up their team and going into different teams. Um, team Goodish, which is Miranda, do you have an update you wanna share? Yeah, so we had our second meeting on Friday, last Friday, February 26th. We have decided to focus on racial bias in the sourcing process. And a lot of the meeting was spent talking about content. What are the assumptions? What is the sourcing process? Where would this bot live as a part of a recruiter's sourcing process um and we talked about what behavior we're trying to target as well as interoperability possibilities uh we don't have any areas that we need support at the moment although we are always welcoming feedback so if any of you xapi heavies have guidance or tips or best practices that is so welcome and um, what we hope to accomplish in the next week is to um, gather some source materials and talk data, what kind of statements we want to run, and do a working session to structure and organize the content of the bot. Awesome. Thank you, Miranda. We're going to hop into Team Slack. Uh, Brian, did you have an update you wanted to share? Yeah. Um, so we've had a couple of meetings uh, so far. Um, we're doing them Wednesday afternoon. So if you're interested in this project and, and want to join in, we've got the, all the details on our Slack channel. Um, I've talked a little bit about use cases. Uh, our team is um, essentially going to, to look at putting together the, the connections between Slack uh, and an LRS to get those XAPI statements. Um, and because a lot of our use cases um, that we've discussed um, are, are looking to capture the same sort of interaction, and then we can divide up those use cases um, uh, kind of on the, on the back end, on the data viz side, um, to, to show a few different examples. Um, so, so far we've, um, in theory and test have put together a couple of connections um, without uh, a lot of um, heavy code lifting, but are looking to next week hopefully get some of uh, uh, development experts involved in the project to be able to talk about some um, how to make this a little bit more scalable um, and really put it into a real world situation. Uh, so that's kind of where we are right now. Awesome, thank you. Um, Kieran, do you have an update for team visualize learner behavior? All right, while we're waiting, maybe Kieran, your mic is muted or you're not live. Um, I'm going to hop into Team XAPI Live Code with Brian. This is Brian. Are you hearing me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, my apologies. Um, we met yesterday. We are meeting weekly Wednesday at about 3.30 afternoon until 5.30. Um, details in the Slack channel. We went over sort of the status. We are currently building multiple instances of a learning record provider as a project within Live Code to act as a baseline. Um, we have... Um, like I said, multiple versions of that. And then the group, we did a review yesterday of, of how things are published into GitHub and where information is available there. And um, we published the update last night. Unfortunately, the video came out without my audio. So it's rather like the team is talking to a ghost. But there's still a very interesting demo that one of our members, Andrew Bell, did of a live code project he built that is interacting with data on the internet. He's actually analyzing 
log files to determine if, if they're getting hacker activity on some of their servers. And he's showing how he's mapping that data. So that, that was an interesting demo that was done. And then the team discussed what our output would be at the end of the project for, say, working demos. We're talking about using our baseline live code project as a starting point and then building like a learning lesson around it. And some of the suggestions we had are showing how to interact with some of the native live code user interface widgets. We're talking about radio buttons and sliders and um, check boxes and other navigation objects, but also like a video object might be an option or a PDF might be an option. So we're going to take some time and, and sort of elaborate on those ideas. We've already got multiple team members that are suggesting how they might do this. Um, some of the detail that came up around the video widget was getting into details on interacting with YouTube videos and how we might, you know, segment a longer piece of video into chunks that we're presenting as part of a lesson. And then uh, one other suggestion we had was to look at the XAPI bookmarklet, which is one of the ADL sample projects that's out on the ADL website. Or actually, excuse me, I think it's on xapi.com website where you can create, you can set up using their web form a sort of a predefined, pre-configured, if you will, form that you then store as a URL on your device. And when you as an individual learner go out and look at content, you can use that bookmark to log into an LRS what you did. So it's not a matter of it having to be built into someone else's content. You are able to sort of take charge of your own learning and say, I did this. And if it, you know, if it gets built into something that can be deployable to, you know, to a larger audience, that might be something that individual learners can use to help log their information. Awesome. Thank you That's for where our team is at. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Uh, Kieran, I see you hop back in. Did you want to share your update for team visualized learner behavior? Sure. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. All yep. right. Um, okay. Our, our project is pretty much fits with what we heard about today. So at the beginning, we identified a couple of re specific research questions we wanted to know about learning behavior. For example, how do they go about reading a lesson? Do they start at the top and go down? Do they start at the top, jump down to find an exercise, work back up, and a few other things? So we did that and then created what I've learned is now called a profile, or at least it's something related to that, a series of specifications of XAPI statements that will help gather the data that we need. And some of those we borrowed actually from uh, JISC, for example, which is an existing profile. Uh, so reuse sounds like a, a good idea. Uh, we have an LRS and now, um, the code is written to to emit those statements from the learning system we use that runs skills courses. And that code is working at least on a, a test system. And hopefully by the start of next week, we'll actually have that live on a couple of running courses. So we'll be gathering statements that can start to answer the questions that we're interested in. Our next step is to write some analysis programs uh, to um, basically back to try to answer the questions. We've already decided what some of the analyses are going to be, but now we just have to write maybe some C-sharp programs to go and query the data and actually have stuff we can display to examine the questions about learner behavior. Awesome, thank you, Kieran. Um, and I, I am hearing you just fine, but it seems like there's some audio. Um, gaps there, but thank you for that. Uh, we do have lots of teams forming. It is perfectly fine to join any team um, at any point throughout cohort. So go ahead and give them a look. You can search for them in Slack um, by going to the channel browser um, and then just type in team and you'll see all the teams that you can join. Go ahead and give that a try to find a team if you don't yet have one. Or if you are thinking about creating a team, feel free to create one and then promote it and ask for folks to join you in the main channel to get some interest.
good things to know. We'll be back here next week at two o'clock. Um, next week, we're going to have Ahur um, from Kaltura, and he's going to talk about what learning analytics is and how you do it. Uh, you can learn more about the party online. Um, we haven't yet opened up our registration, uh, but that is coming soon. And we will also have a call for proposals. Um, so that is also coming soon. So stay tuned there. As always, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to email our help desk or send me a message in Slack. With that, have a great Thursday and get out there and make something. Um, have a have a great week, y'all.